Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Animaction, and welcome once more to the Animated 80s. This week is my 8th video in the series, meaning we're very quickly nearing the end of the decade. Two more years after this video, then my summary and ranking video, and then it's time to move on to something new. What will that new thing be? Do you think I should do the same thing I did here, but with the 90s? How about the 70s? Do you prefer I stay in the 80s and cover animated movies? And what about my alternate videos each week? I've got Japan and the UK, want me to keep going with those? Cover other countries? Do more entries in my Cartoonical Analysis series? I'll be honest, I've got a ton of topics I want to cover, and a ton of videos I want to make. The problem I have is that I don't know when or what order to do them in. That's where you guys all come in. I've created a Patreon with a $1 monthly tier that will let me use the site's polling feature, and my intent is to use that to dictate my content. I plan to put up at least one weekly poll that lets anybody on that tier that's interested in participating guide those content decisions. I have no expectations with Patreon, and I'm not going to pimp it out with every video I make. I just wanted you all to know that I created that option for anyone who wants a voice in my process. Link is down below. So enough about that. Quick reminder to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and check Instagram where my tune of the week is robotics. Enough is enough though, so on with the show. Yeah, it's a bit much. Before we move on, let's do a quick recap of where we landed in 1986. We talked about some series that pushed the absolute limits of the toy cartoon relationship. We talked about cartoons covering a wider range of source material, even going so far as to expand into R-rated movie territory. I mentioned the introduction of space westerns in the most pure sense of the term, a deepening divide between genders, and even more channels entering the animation arena with Nickelodeon and their exclusive ongoing series from the year. Do those observations hold up, and does the decade continue to expand on them, or was I finding patterns where none exist? Well, it's time to find out as we dive headfirst into 1987. As usual, we'll start by taking a look at what was still hanging around from the previous years. Like I said last video, 80 and 82 had both run their course with no shows from either year still in the air. 1981 still had Smurfs, and 83 still had Elvin and the Chipmunks, with Donald Duck Presents and Good Morning Mickey still going strong on the Disney Channel. From 1984, we were still watching the Transformers, Snorks, Muppet Babies, and Danger Mouse. And there was still some decent representation from 1985 too, with Jem, the Berenstain Bears, She-Ra, Princess of Power, Adventures of the Gummy Bears, The Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera, Thundercats, and the Raccoons. And finally, from last year, we continued to have the Flintstone Kids, Potato Head Kids, My Little Pony and Friends, Pee Wee's Playhouse, Johnny Quest, Popples, Pound Puppies, Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea, Teen Wolf, Dennis the Menace, Foofer, Kissy Fur, Mysterious Cities of Gold, The Real Ghostbusters, and The Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show. That's a decent number of holdovers, but I don't see a lot of action there. So let's take a look at what went away. Ouch, does this one hurt. Firstly, we lost Inspector Gadget and G.I. Joe A Real American Hero, both of which had premiered in 1984, as well as a laundry list of great action shows from 85. These included Ewoks, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, Mask, Super Sunday with Robotics and Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines with it, and Galtar and the Golden Lance from the Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera. The casualty list from 1986 may be even worse, though, with Macron 1, The Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers, Centurions, Defenders of the Earth, The Non-Real Ghostbusters, Galaxy High School, Inhumanoids, Karate Commandos, Ulysses 31, Laser Tag Academy, Rambo the Force of Freedom, Silverhawks, and Wildfire, all being single-season, one-and-done shows. So many awesome classics that faded away this year. We damn well better have gotten some great shows to replace all of these, because this was a huge blow to our 80s animated action-loving selves. So did we? Well, I've got some good news on that front, as this year saw 31 new series premiere on our TVs. For the most part, the shows that we'll be talking about in this video were pretty decent, too, and there was definitely something for everyone. It's a nicely thorough mix of genres and age ranges in this lineup, and a pretty solid release schedule overall. Is it enough to numb the sting of what we lost? Well, I've got it broken down in my typical randomly analytical approach, so let's get to the deep dive and see what's what. 
Another year, another batch of returning classics. This year saw the release of several, including Astro Boy, The Archies, Popeye, The Jetsons, Mighty Mouse, and Woody Woodpecker. Astro Boy came back with an English dub of the new Astro Boy series that had aired in Japan in 1980. This series followed the same basic premise as the original 1963 series, but with some new characters and updates to more modern sensibilities. If any of you saw it in 1986 and want to well actually me in the comments, then that's fair, as it had a limited release that year in parts of Pennsylvania, but its full syndicated release was this year. It was kind of a strange release too, as both Australia and Canada got the series a full year or two before we did. The Archies started as the title and supporting characters from Archie Comics, first published in 1941, and who got their first animated series in 1968 from Filmation. They came back this year in a new series from Deke called, appropriately enough, The New Archies. It was a reimagining of the characters as younger middle-aged... That doesn't make sense. It was a reimagining of the characters as younger middle school-aged kids and followed their slice-of-life adventures. It only got 14 episodes, but it was still a better reboot than Riverdale. Popeye made his second return this decade with Popeye and Son. This one focused more on the Popeye family than just the Sailor Man, with the Son having the same spinach-based super ability as his dad, though he also hates the taste of spinach. This one also had another interesting spin on the series by continuing to make Popeye and Bluto mortal enemies, but having their kids actually have a fairly decent relationship. The Jetsons also came back with new episodes as their official season 3 after a year off in 1986. And Mighty Mouse made a second comeback this decade as well, with Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures, oddly enough created by the controversial animator Ralph Bakshi. This one made Mighty Mouse a more traditional superhero with a secret identity and a sidekick. It also, as you'd probably expect from a Bakshi cartoon, contained a lot more satire and risque humor than any of the older series. The final classic comeback this year was from a character making his first 80s appearance, Woody Woodpecker. This one basically took the Looney Tunes formula, running 90 minute blocks of old Woody cartoons featuring him and his supporting characters like Chilly Willy, and interspersed with musical montage numbers. Sure, you could watch any number of Woody reruns at other points in the decade, but this was his first new series. This year also brought a handful of series, much like Foofer from last year, that I just don't know what to do with. So we'll throw them all together here and get them out of the way. These shows include The Little Clowns of Happy Town, Seabert, Little Wizards, and Maple Town. The Little Clowns of Happy Town were one of several properties in the 80s, joining others like Bozo, Ronald McDonald, Pennywise, etc., that probably caused a huge surge of chlorophobia amongst 80s kids. This show basically told the story of a group of creepy clown kids on a quest to spread happiness and positivity, with some negative Nelly villains often standing in their way. And yes, I said negative Nelly, which is honestly better than the villain's actual name of awful be bad. Maple Town was a new Japanese import this year that followed the story of an anthropomorphic rabbit named Patty, uh, Hopper Rabbit. Clever. As she attempted to retrieve a stolen bag of mail from the thief, Wild Wolf, another creative moniker. The Hopper Rabbit family ends up settling in Maple Town as mailmen, and keep an eye out to stop Wild Wolf and his dastardly schemes. This next one, even though it aired on network television, ABC specifically, is one that I have absolutely no recollection of whatsoever. Little Wizards was the story of a prince whose father was murdered by an evil wizard who, together with his magician teacher, dragon, and three monsters, fight to stop the evil wizard so Dexter, who is the prince, can retake his rightful throne. The description sounds like it could potentially qualify as action, but the intro doesn't really look like it. Let me know if you've seen this one and how you'd classify it, as I'm completely at a loss here. And lastly in this well, I guess it's a category, is Seabert. This one was originally a French series and is about a couple of kids and their pet white seal traveling around and saving animals. And that's pretty much it. They go up against hunters and poachers and the like and save animals. I never saw it as a kid because it was an HBO exclusive, but it sure sounds an awful lot like a predecessor to Go Diego Go. We had a couple of cartoons hit the air this year that were adaptation of live action shows too. The first one was adapted from a show originally airing on HBO from 1983 to, well, this year, ironically enough. It's one that I didn't cover in the 1983 episode, as puppet shows were outside of the scope I set for this series. Let me know if you want them in their own episode. But it's a Jim Henson classic. Fraggle Rock, the animated series, followed the exact same format as the puppet version, 
used the puppet version theme song, and actually included clips from the puppet version as bookends. The primary difference between the two versions of the show was that the animated series uses different voice actors and only showed human characters from the neck down, a la Muppet Babies. Other than that, the shows were pretty much identical in structure and storytelling. The other adaptation we got this year was a far weirder choice. ALF the Animated Series was a spin-off of the concurrently airing live-action sitcom ALF and told a series of prequel stories of the title character's adventures on Melmac before coming to Earth and meeting the Tanner family. ALF in the cartoon was voiced by the series' creator, who was the puppeteer and voice actor for the character in the live-action show as well, and each episode is actually introduced by the puppet in a live-action segment. ALF was a weird show, and an even weirder cartoon, but maybe weirdest of all is that it was only one of two that came out this decade. Check back next episode to hear more about that. So remember those toys last year that didn't really have backstories but got their own animated series anyway? Yeah, we got a couple more of those this year too. Sylvanian Families, My Pet Monster, and Teddy Ruxpin were all existing toy lines that made their first animated appearances this year. Sylvanian Families was a series of anthropomorphic animal toys created by a Japanese company in 1985. They were tiny, barely poseable plastic figures that came flocked, or to use the far more technical term, fuzzy. They essentially came out with several different animal types and playsets, and the animated series pretty much just adapts the designs into a slice of life story as the animals have various adventures around, I guess, Sylvania? I assume that was the name of the town. I never saw the series myself or any of the toys until my own kids got some Calico Critters playsets a couple decades later. My Pet Monster was a blue ogre-looking plush toy released in 1986, and was the rare boy-centric plush. The thing had no backstory and no real play features, you know, like most plush, but did come wearing a set of plastic manacles. It was pretty popular though, and got both a direct-to-video live-action movie and a cartoon that came out this year. The cartoon follows the antics of a boy named Max and his pet monster named Monster, who turns into a stuffed animal when the manacles are clamped on. No one knows that Monster is really alive other than Max's sister and his best friend, and they basically just spend the series trying to keep it that way, as they're stalked by a nosy neighbor, or keep Monster from being captured and taken back to Monster World. I remember the toy, but I never had or wanted one, and I can't say I watched the series. But finally from the toy shelves this year came the adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. This series was based on one of the earliest animatronic toys I can remember, Teddy Ruxpin. It was a mechanical teddy bear with lifeless eyes that had a tape deck in its back that would make it move and react when you put story cassettes in. For those of you who don't know, a tape deck was a player for a type of magnetic media that contained data or audio back in the Stone Ages, called a cassette. The tapes, which is actually another word for cassette, that you put in Teddy were essentially audiobooks that told different stories around the character. As the best-selling toy of both 1985 and 86, it's no surprise that an animated series followed. The series came from Deke and follows Teddy and his friend leaving home on a treasure hunt, with them learning about ancient history, magic, fighting a group of evil villains, and searching for Teddy's missing father along the way. This year saw a pretty hefty influx of girl-targeted series as well, building on the success of the previous years. There were four shows that premiered in 1987 that I would categorize here. Well, five, but we've already covered Sylvanian Families. The four I haven't talked about yet, though, include Maxie's World, Beverly Hills Teens, Lady Lovely Locks, and Hello Kitty's Furry Tale Theater. Maxie's World was a series that came out as a companion to Hasbro's Maxie Fashion Dolls, which they released as a direct competitor to Barbie. In this series, the title character is a cheerleading honor roll surfer girl that hosts an independently produced investigative reporting show called Maxie's World. The series follows Maxie and her friends as they investigate various stories to be covered on the show and is actually pretty message heavy with how it presented various teenage concerns and issues of the time. Beverly Hills Teens was a series about a bunch of entitled rich kids and their lives of going to a rich kid's school and hanging out at the country club and shopping on Rodeo Drive. You know, one of those series we could all relate to. The main characters are a club made up of every high school archetype of the era and deal with them having to handle high school romance and the jealousy of other students, homecoming queen battles, and every other type of teen conflict you can think of. Hello Kitty's Furry Tail Theater took Japan's ridiculously popular Hello Kitty characters and put them into a series that had them spoofing famous fairy tales and pop culture stories. It ran for 13 episodes, with each episode telling two different stories and covered everything from Cinderella to E.T., Dracula to Jaws, and plenty more. 
It sounds like a series that would have appealed to all kids, and is interesting to me as I research it for this video, but it had Hello Kitty as the main characters, pretty much ensuring it would never be seen by boy eyes. And finally in this category, we have Lady Lovely Locks and the Pixie Tales. This series focused on a group of hair-themed characters and animals, along with their living hair accessory sidekicks, the Pixie Tales. It was similar in structure to what Strawberry Shortcake did with food-based characters, which was appropriate as it was produced by the same company that made that show. Lady Lovely Locks and her friends fight against the attempts of an evil duchess to take over the kingdom of Lovely Locks through a series of episodic evil schemes. I personally don't think that the girls got anything this year that could rival She-Ra or Jem, but I wasn't really the target audience. So any ladies watching this series will have to share their thoughts on the subject below. Building on the space western concept introduced by the Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers in the previous year, 1987 gave us two new series that employed the formula. We'll start here by looking at Brave Star, one of the members of 80s action royalty. This show told the tales of a superpowered sheriff based on a Native American archetype, though he was actually a member of a group called the Tribe, which seems to be a non-nation specific amalgamation of descendants of actual Native Americans, as he protects the space frontier planet of New Texas from outlaws and bandits. Together with allies like his transforming, talking, mechanical horse companion 3030, Judge J.B. McBride, his foster father Shaman, who probably deserved a spot on my recent top 10 dads list, and his deputy Fuzz, combined with his amazing superpowers of Yeah, those. Protected New Texas's citizens from various threats like the kingpin-like Stampede and evil villains like the Carrion Bunch. The series only lasted for a single 65-episode season, even though it deserved way more, but at least we got an animated movie. The other space western of the year, Saber Rider and the Star Sheriffs, was built on the foundation of a Japanese series called Star Musketeer Bismarck. The original Bismarck series was bought by World Events Productions, rewritten and reordered, and then supplemented with a handful of new episodes to finally become the Western-themed Saber Rider. I say Western-themed, but the main character wears musketeer-style armor, speaks in formal British English, and mostly fights with a cavalry saber, which is to say he seems specifically out of place in the desert frontier-type settings. One of his team, though, is a quintessential cowboy that much more closely fits the production theme. The other team members of the Star Sheriffs are a race car driver and an engineer responsible for creating the ship slash giant robot they travel in. Have no doubt though, even with the out of place main character, it's a western through and through, with the law enforcement organization they belong to called Cavalry Command and based out of a western fort looking facility, the presence of robot horses as a primary mode of transportation, and various other wild west set dressings throughout. It's a pretty good show either way, and definitely worth checking out. There's another series that came out this year that I want to talk about, even though it's pretty wildly different from what I usually cover. That series is Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. This was a live-action show, but really still an 80s cartoon to its very core. It aired during normal cartoon programming times, was released in support of an accompanying toy line, featured all the hallmarks of what I define as an animated action from the period, and was even filmed in an animated feeling flow with the way scenes transitioned. It was full of cool characters and cool technology, with interesting suit designs and transformation sequences. Most importantly of all though, and the main reason that I wanted to highlight it here, is that it was interactive. All of the ships and playsets in the toy series came with built-in lasers operated by a trigger in the play handle. The show itself was animated with flashing red targets on many of the enemies. As you watched, you could physically shoot at the bad guys with your toys and keep track of your score. It was a really great concept and pretty engaging. They even released several episodes on different VHS tapes during the initial run so that you didn't have to wait for the series to come on during its normal runtime to play. It was innovative and unique for the time, and deserved some special attention here. That brings us to the first of two series I wanted to cover by itself, as it was a pretty significant release for this year. If you recognize the series by the title card, then congrats. If not, where have you been? This show, and the theme song in particular, remain popular to this day. It's Disney's DuckTales. This show was awesome, and pretty much beloved by everyone I've ever talked to, 80s kid or not. But this is where it started, following the adventures of Scrooge McDuck on his never-ending quest to increase his fortune, accompanied by his great nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie, in the most tolerable representations of the characters ever put to film. 
The series had everything, covering every theme and every genre over its four seasons, taking the cast on adventures across every part of the planet, and even a few into outer space. It was a huge step for Disney's expanding footprint into 80s network children's television, and gained an immediate and loyal audience. It also led to what may be the best licensed video game of all time in DuckTales for the NES. But setting the stage for what was to come was its biggest contribution, being the harbinger for shows like Tailspin, Rescue Rangers, and Darkwing Duck. The series is probably fondly remembered by almost every kid of every age alive during this period, and if I had to bet, I'd say most of us can still sing the theme song to this day. And yet DuckTales wasn't the most important, longest-lasting, or biggest franchise to come out this year. That title goes to the most important, longest-lasting, largest media-dominating property of the entire decade, running almost uninterrupted in one form or another since its premiere this year. I'm talking about the one and only Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Since the first episode of TMNT aired on December 14th of this year, side note, I almost put them in 1988, maybe I should have, oh well. But since then, the Turtles have had an actively airing series for 32 out of those 38 years. I apologize if that sentence made any of you feel as old as it made me feel. But seriously, this series had more airtime, more merchandising, more media variety, and more sponsorship than any other that came out in the entire decade. There was almost no item that didn't come in a TMNT theme back then, and the franchise generated, according to a New York Times article cited on Wikipedia, the modern equivalent of nearly $12 billion by 1994, and for which the merchandising machine has been continuously running ever since. The toy line for the original series was big enough to rival G.I. Joe, with hundreds of figures and dozens of playsets and vehicles to go with them. There were home system video games, handheld games on Game Boy, multiple arcade cabinet games, and even several of the standalone handheld, and Turtle games have appeared on almost every home console since. There have been several movies, a touring live-action Ninja Turtles band, and even amusement park rides based on the characters. Not bad for a spoof idea that a couple of struggling comic artists offhandedly put together while sharing an apartment that was originally targeted at a much older audience. The whole concept was essentially a spoof of the most popular comics of the time, combining the Teenage Mutants of the X-Men with the ninjas of Daredevil and wrapping them up in a turtle shell. Even Shredder was a joke, supposedly born from one of the artists making dinner one night and putting a cheese grater on his forearm, though I don't remember where I originally heard that story, so don't cite me on it. There's endless source material that could fuel TMNT videos for weeks, but for the sake of this video, I'll leave things there. TMNT was massive, is still massive, and doesn't show signs of stopping yet. We'll wrap up the year with the eight action series that 1987 brought with it that we haven't already covered. There were some real gems in this group, with some of them being personal favorites of mine. As the channel primarily focuses on these, and I cover them pretty extensively elsewhere, and will continue to do so in the future, we'll go through them pretty quick. This video is getting long enough as it is. So first we'll look at an anthology series from the year that contained one of the coolest concepts of the decade. The comic strip was a 90 minute program consisting of 20 minute episodes of four different series. Those series included Street Frogs, which was remarkably similar to TMNT, but used frogs instead. And, well, they weren't ninjas. It was pretty much Teen Slice of Life, with frogs. A series called Karate Cat, featuring an anthropomorphic cat who worked as a private investigator and uses karate, what else, to fight crime throughout his town. The Mini Monsters, which basically applied the Muppet Babies formula to the Universal Monsters. And last, but certainly not least, the absolute best show that the series was comprised of, and the main one that most of us here care about, Tiger Sharks. This was an awesome show about a team of underwater slash space explorers who can use the science of a machine called the fish tank to turn into human and aquatic creature hybrids, allowing them to defend the planet Watero from the threats against it. I say human and aquatic creature hybrids instead of fish people because several of them were actually mammals, but I digress. This year also brought us the Bionic Six, which followed a super-powered family defending the world from an evil scientist and his minions. Then there was Spiral Zone, which followed a team of the world's greatest soldiers trying to recapture the planet from an evil scientist and his minions. Starcom, the US Space Force, followed a space-based military unit protecting the solar system from an evil scientist and his minions. We also got the sword and sorcery show Visionaries, Knights of the Magical Light, 
which told the story of a team of heroic knights with the ability to magically take the form of animals fighting against the schemes of a similarly powered team of evil knights. Dino Saucers followed the adventures of a race of anthropomorphic dinosaur aliens who came to Earth from its counterpart planet on the opposite side of the sun as they fought against their evil counterparts here on our planet, who were similarly powered evil dinosaurs. Sky Commanders was a series about a specialized team of mountaineers, defending a mysterious new continent and its wealth of resources from a team of similarly equipped evil counterparts. I know I'm making light of all the similarities between the series that came out this year, but I can't stress how much those similarities just didn't matter to me. I love that this era of cartoons realized that most of their core concepts weren't broken, so they didn't feel the need to constantly reinvent the wheel. At the end of the day, the characters, the technology, and the settings in each were different enough that I didn't, and still don't to this very day, care how much they had in common. I plan on doing in-depth deep dives of several of these series in the future though, so we'll move on. Lastly this year, we got a new version of the characters from Battle of the Planets, called G-Force, Guardians of Space. This version got rid of Seven's Arc 7 and the character names, and was an adaptation of Gachaman that was a lot more faithful to the original Japanese series. That in itself is awesome, and I support a more source-accurate interpretation, but I personally can't get past the new character names. Ace Goodhart, Dirk Daring, Agatha June, Peewee, and Hoot Owl, or more familiarly to his friends, Hootie, sound more like spoofs than anything. I'm happy to report that as of June 2023, there are actually a relatively small number of these series that have no official way of being watched and never had an official release. These include the comic strip in its different series, Dino Saucers, Spiral Zone, Bionic 6, Seabert, Sylvanian Families, and Little Wizards. The Little Clowns of Happy Town doesn't have a full release, but you can pick up a few episodes on an import DVD if you're so inclined. Maple Town can also be bought on DVD in its original Japanese form, but be prepared to take out a second mortgage if you plan to go that route. Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future was also released on a DVD, but is now currently out of print. Also, if you were wondering, no, the DVD doesn't have the animated target spots. Much like the Nintendo Light Zapper, they don't work on flat screen TVs anyway. Lastly, for these titles, Lady Lovely Locks got a full German DVD release, and Visionaries, Knights of the Magical Light, got a full UK DVD release if you want to try and track either of those down. I know at least a few of these series can be found here on YouTube in their entirety, in varying degrees of quality, so that's a good place to start if you want to give them a watch. Some other series did get DVD releases, but are currently out of print and pretty pricey as well, including G-Force Guardians of Space, which had a release of the first three episodes, Brave Star, which can currently be watched on its official YouTube channel, and Starcom, the U.S. Space Force, which is available on Pluto TV. A number of the other series from this year can also be streamed elsewhere online, with My Pet Monster, The New Archies, and The Woody Woodpecker Show available on Tubi, and Elf the Animated Series, Popeye and Son, Hello Kitty's Furry Tale Theater, and The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin, all available on Prime Video. Everything else from this year has at least partial DVD releases available that I've linked below as usual, including Astro Boy, Beverly Hills Teens, Fraggle Rock the Animated Series, Maxi's World, Sky Commanders, The Jetsons, Mighty Mouse The New Adventures, Saber Rider and the Star Sheriffs, DuckTales, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As usual, get them while they last, because in my experience, they don't. So that's everything there was to be had for 1987 U.S. premieres. It was a pretty decent list when it was all said and done, but the question of whether what we got was good enough to replace what we lost is most definitely a matter of personal opinion. For me, some of my favorite 80s shows hit this year, but I'll refrain from saying any more until we get to my ranking at the end of this video series. Let me know what you all think of the year in the comments. I'm not sure what my alternating video for the week will be, so I guess you can consider that a surprise sometime around Sunday or Monday. Remember that if you want a future say in the decision, though, you can have one for a buck a month at the Patreon link below. If you liked this video and all things 80s and animated, then like and subscribe if you haven't already. This year and last got pretty freaking long, so I'm kind of looking forward to taking it a little easier with the smaller release lineups in 1988 and 89 over the next couple of weeks. Make sure to come back and see if those years are a matter of quality over quantity. Thanks for watching, everyone. Stay tuned and stay tuned. As in cartoons. Later.